Crimson Petals. Written and read by John Catanch. When the first rays of July sunshine filtered through smoke created by three days incessant shelling, it became apparent that it was another scorching day. For many, the last sunrise they would witness, a day that would be remembered as one of the greatest catastrophes in British military history. As the shelling ceased, Jimmy gazed at the lumbering figure of Private Collins deep in prayer, Morris tying with his rifle, and Gifford rereading his wife's latest letter. At his side, his best pal Tom Williams gave a reassuring wink. Jimmy's mouth was parched, his heart pounding, his stomach knotted, as he desperately tried to prevent his hand shaking. A tiny crumb of consolation was gleaned from the knowledge that every one of them shared his fear. Further up the line, the silence was marked by the rapturous melody of a lone bird perched on a charred tree stump. Here, it was broken by something more basic. Thomas farted, a rattling eruption, and his last as only five minutes remained of his all too brief life. It brought a mixture of laughter and light-hearted curses, cut short by the grating voice of Lieutenant Dawkins. OK, calm down. Two minutes and we're off. Remember, we walk, keep him well apart. I'll shoot the first man who runs. The wire's in shreds and any hand still alive will be desperate to surrender. It'll be like a Sunday stroll in the park. Now fix bayonets. Dawkins studies his pocket watch as the men congregated behind the wooden steps leading from the trenches to no man's land. At exactly 7.30am, he blew one long blast on his whistle and began ascending the steps, closely followed by soldiers who had taken comfort from Haig's message, words that sadly proved fallacious. The Germans had sheltered in trench systems constructed with Teutonic precision, and as the bombardment ceased, they emerged ready and waiting. The rolls of wire were intact. All the shells had done was blast them into the air to land in the same place. History records it as pure carnage, the military equivalent of shooting tin ducks at the fair. Wake up, Jimmy. You've been dreaming. Look at the state of your bedclothes. He automatically felt for his spectacles and placed them gingerly on his wizened nose. Moira was drawing back the curtains to reveal the cornflower blue sky of a fresh summer's day. Lovely morning and your big day, I bet you're excited. I'll fetch you a cuppa. His roomy eyes studied the familiar walls, basic furniture and family photographs, but his mind remained fixedly on the images of that fateful July morning, 60 years ago to the day. He recalled getting midway to the enemy trenches whilst friends fell all around. He glimpsed Morris flattened into the French soil by a hail of bullets. Thomas blown to pieces only the breeze could detect. Dawkins close enough to the German lines to see that the wire was intact. Deep, numb in pain in his right shoulder, a bullet wound. Stumbling into a shell hole, he surveyed the damage. As he grappled for his field dressings and strenuously applied pressure to staunch the bleeding, he realised he wasn't alone. He recognised a dour 19-year-old, Albert Watkins. Shrapnel had shattered the left side of his face, exposing flesh and splintered bone, and he saw that Watkins also had a severe abdominal wound. Ignoring the noise and chaos, he set to work to aid his comrade. There we are, one kappa, two slices of toast and a bowl of cornflakes. You're quiet, I hope you're not sickening for something. No, more, I'm fine. Right, I'll leave you to your breakfast. I can't hang about chatting. This is Lewis, love my guts for garters. Alone again, and in a perverse way, he remained greedy for memories. Within seconds, he was young again and in the crater. The signs were clear. Watkins was still bleeding heavily and barely conscious. I'm hurting, ma'am. Where are you? I want to go home. All right, Albert, lad, you'll be fine. Relax, I'll look after you. Under intense gunfire, there was no prospect of retreating to the British lines. All he could do was hold Watkins as his spirit finally wrenched itself free of the flesh. In some ways, Jimmy envied him his release from the land that sanity had forgotten. Yet he also retained as a desire to survive, return to normality, realise his dreams, to live. He remained alongside Albert's body, occasionally sipping water, attempting to distance himself from reality. As darkness fell, he realised it was time to move. Acutely aware of the dull ache in his shoulder, he slung his rifle onto his good left side and peered out. Now was as good a time as any. Hesitantly, he crawled out and lay flat on his stomach, anticipating the bullets. Aren't you up yet, you lazy bagger? Come on, shower, shave, and what's the third one beginning with sh? It was Bronwyn. 
who lacked Moira's semi-civilized upbringing and possessed the loudest cackle known to mankind. She employed it now in response to her own smutty quip. If you don't get up before I'm a minute older, I'll get a freezing flannel and give you a bed bath. That'll get you moving. She collected the untouched breakfast. Best bib and tucker. We can't have you shaming us, not with the big wigs coming. She waddled off as Jimmy hauled himself up, pulling on his paisley dressing gown and grabbing his toiletry bag. He shuffled down the corridor of the St. Augustus residential home and into the bathroom. As he shaved, he studied his wrinkled features in the mirror, a weather-beaten face aged by the heat, wind and rain of 82 years. An image of someone who had worked, loved, fathered two children, retired and buried his wife. He'd had his life, unlike the friends he'd left on the Somme, who had given theirs for a war they barely understood. In his mind, they lived on, laughed, swore, fought and died. And unlike him, remained young forever. Returning to his room, he began to dress, searching through the bedside cabinet for the box containing his service medals. As he pinned them on, his mind returned to the battlefield, cautiously crawling back to the ranks and trying to blot out the pleas and whimpering, silently praying that his comrades wouldn't mistake him for the enemy in open fire. So the commotion he caught in Muffle's voice that he recognised. Is that you, Jimmy Bach? For Christ's sake, help me. I can't move my sodden legs. It was Tom, clearly in a bad way and unable to move. Jimmy considered his options. Dragging Tom would be impossible. He would have to carry him. Jimmy strapped his rifle across his friend's shoulders and gingerly tried to lift. It was agony, even though Tom was slight. At the third attempt, he got him onto his back and painstakingly resumed his trek across the barren, pitted landscape. On reaching the relative security of the trenches, Jimmy was exhausted, but his troubles were far from over. Medical support was stretched beyond capacity, and it was well into the following afternoon before anything more than basic first aid could be administered. By then, his friend had lost consciousness, and when he passed away five days later, it was a blessed relief, though Jimmy was mortified, despite the gradual progress noted on his own medical records. Paper today, Jimmy? With a start, he was back. Sorry I woke you. Having a quick nap, were you? Why not stroll around the garden before lunch? It's lovely out there. It was Moira. No, I wasn't sleeping, just, well... Reflecting. I don't want a paper, but I think I will pop outside. The garden was in full bloom and the sun shimmered in a cloudless periwinkle sky. The weathermen were predicting a heat wave that could last for weeks. He strolled around the manicured lawn and made for a bench in the shade. Sitting down, he tried to compose himself. He was futile. Corpulent, sleek rats, gorged on human intestine. Clouds of mustard gas wafted on the breeze. Freezing nights on sentry duty. The stench of a trench foot, the constant itching caused by lice, and the blissful relief of a cold bath and fumigated clothes. Gradually, he realised that he was back in 1976, 11.50. In two hours, the celebrations would begin, an event arranged by Mildred Lewis, the owner of the home, to commemorate Jimmy's bravery. He suspected that the occasion had been organised to bring publicity to the home, rather than acknowledge the minuscule part he had played in a historic conflict. But he felt obliged to play along. A member of an ever dwindling number, their heroism almost forgotten by the general public, except for a Sunday each November when they were wheeled out for general inspection. The time ebbed by, he welcomed his children, Paul and June, their partners and his six grandchildren. The staff, residents, dignitaries, and family gathered in the main hall. Mrs. Lewis flapped around the mayor and his entourage, clad in her finery, her dyed black hair freshly reconstituted, reminded him of an animated stick insect. Jimmy studied the faces, noting Paul sneak a glance at his watch, no doubt concerned about the missing pub time. His bored grandchildren, the smiling staff, a journalist from the local rag making notes, and the mayor peering over his bifocals. To muted applause, Mrs. Lewis finished her introduction and passed the microphone to the mayor, Councillor Chambers. The name was all Jimmy remembered, phrases such as immense bravery, intense German gunfire, and eternally grateful failed to sink in. His mind was elsewhere. He recalled being shipped home, the emotional visit to Tom Williams' mother, the convalescence and his welcome discharge when it became clear that he would never recover the full use of his right arm, for him the perfect blighty. As he gazed around, he realised that no one had the first clue as to what it had been like, how he tried to collect the shattered pieces, ashamed of the recurring nightmares, waking in a soiled bed, attempting to convince himself that he was the lucky one. Even historians and grainy film reels could only partially portray the true horrors. The lengthy applause brought him back to the present. The mayor was extending an arm and aided by June, he plodded across the floor 
where, to continue the applause, he was presented with a medal and scroll. And as he faced the sea of smiling faces, he felt his mood lift and the all enveloping cloud of gloom evaporated. Not because the horrors were any less dark, but because no future generations would experience the gruesome realities of trench warfare. And youngsters such as his grandsons, Peter and David, would mature in a world where common sense prevailed. As the gathering dispersed, he knew that he'd also won his personal reprieve. There in his mind eye stood Tom, young, smiling and radiant. No longer the semi-comatose agony, the fear, the accusing deathly face that had invaded his sleeping hours for so long. And Jimmy knew that the action he had taken in the field hospital had been justified. The secret he had anguished over for 60 years. For that night, when the whimpering cries and pleas from the adjoining bed had become too much, Jimmy had gently smothered Tom with his own pillow and ended the life of the person he regarded as his own brother, the one man he truly loved. When his time came, he would go to his grave with a clear conscience. He was exonerated. And unlike the true perpetrators, whose crimes would never be forgotten, he and Tom, Gifford and Morris, and all the rest would always be remembered by a grateful nation for as long as the poppies bloom. <laughs>